Miss Clary here, and I am going to do a demonstration of how I would do visual analysis of rhetoric used in an image. What I'm using here is an image that you've probably seen before. It's Terence Donovan's famous 1990 portrait of Diana, Princess of Wales. However, you're going to notice that I'm not talking a great deal about the history of the photograph. We don't need that information in order to conduct a rhetorical analysis of the choices made. When Terence Donovan took this picture, it was not yet the iconic photo. It was a photo he was taking of an important personage, and he made the choices about how to pose her, and she made the choices about how to pose, simply as a way to convey a rhetorical message. So let's observe what we have going on in this picture. The first thing that I'm noticing is the positioning of the subject's head. We've got this slight tilt to her head at the top of the long neck, and this has the effect of displaying her jawline, which gives her a very traditionally attractive presentation. Also though, the tilt of her head doesn't feel completely formal. There's a suggestion of intimacy. She looks almost as though she's inviting you to come sit next to her. She looks more approachable because she's not rigidly straight the way that you would see someone sitting up rigidly straight in perhaps an older uh, portrait of a British royal. So we've got that inviting head tilt that makes her seem a little softer, a little more approachable. That sense of softness is reinforced by the way her hair is styled. It's 1990, so of course the hair is big, but notice this kind of sweeping softness of the line. It contrasts with the sharper lines of her profile in such a way that it reinforces that softness, that femininity, because of course gendering is largely enforced through these sorts of visual cues. It also partially covers her tiara. So while the tiara is very visible here, the beauty of her, the femininity, the approachability, this sense of elegant softness actually occludes the royalty in this image a little. But of course, lest we forget, she's also got earrings to further emphasize that she is bejeweled, she is adorned. This is a portrait of wealth and of power. Contrasting that sense of power, however, look at her hands. They're folded very neatly in her lap. They're, I'm, it's going beyond the edge of the image, but I'm pretty sure that they're partially obscured in the folds of this beautiful gown. These are not hands that are doing things. There's a sense of patience. She feels very posed, very etiquette oriented because of the passivity of the hand positioning here. And again, they're placed very evenly. She looks polite. She looks approachable. She doesn't lose her dignity, but she looks like someone who's listening to you which again is reinforced by that head tilt. Notice it brings one of her ears to be a lot more visible as the focal point. I'll move my cursor so you can actually see her ear. The deep neckline of the bolero jacket over the gown is interesting to me because you've got this sort of formal standing collar, but then the bodice of the dress itself sits quite low. So we've got a hint of sexiness sort of restrained by the formality of the bolero. Not too formal though, because see her wrist protrudes beyond the sleeve. We're seeing a little arm, a little person under the jacket. And other notes about the clothing, the skirt has been allowed to pile a little. So we get the impression that this is a full romantic traditional dress, even though we can't see the whole thing. The bodice is elaborately beaded and the bolero is done to match in a way that kind of reminds me again of older portraits, but modernized. This is very much a 1980s, early 1990s outfit she's wearing. 
And yet the florals, the very symmetrical, effusive, large florals, feel a little old-fashioned. They feel like a reference to older embroidery styles. And the last element here is the background. It's, it's a very sort of classic studio portrait background, which is, I, I think this was probably not the artist's intention, but that looks like a Sears portrait, like you probably took with your family when you were five. So it introduces sort of an element of commonality to it, which reinforces the approachability. I anticipate that was not the artist's intention because it doesn't quite match the exclusivity implied by this full white dress by the tiara. So it's probable that it was simply a background that reinforced the combination of formality and softness here. And yet, to a modern audience, it might look a little less formal than perhaps it did at the time because now we've all taken Sears portraits. So hopefully this has demonstrated how we can look at an image to see the visual rhetorical choices that the photographer, the subject, maybe one, maybe the other, maybe both, have made in order to create the photograph as a rhetorical production that we can analyze the rhetoric of in much the same way that we would analyze a piece of writing. And you saw those logos, pathos, and ethos appeals too. Ethos, credibility, approachability, the pathos of the softness and beauty that is given. I'm not seeing a lot of logos appeal in this one. We're living in the realm of emotional and ideological appeal here. Oh, and I just noticed one more thing. Notice that her arms have been arranged so they're very, very straight up and down. She's not in a super rigid pose. This feels like a way you could sit and have tea and not just a way that you could sit and look into a camera. And yet the very straight lines of her arms introduce a little of that formality back into it. So overall, the image walks a very fine line between the emotional appeal of this is the people's princess, this is someone you could come and talk to, and the ethos credibility of she's still royalty. She's still acting in the tradition of the British monarchy when she poses for this portrait. So when you see those elements that balance to create the overall impression, and it's okay if you didn't see all of these, this takes a lot of practice, this allows you to talk about the photograph or the painting or the advertisement or the sketch or the doodle in the back of your notebook as a rhetorical production in very much the same way that you could talk about a written product. So hopefully this served as a good example for you. We'll look at a couple of others in the coming days and I will see you again soon.